it's so good that we can start tackling the, the nature of knowledge so early on in your master's studies, or for those of you doing doctoral research as well, to start unpicking it now. Um, some of you who are doing PhDs, obviously the word philosophy is built into your actual degree, but it's not the case of doing philosophy studying the the ancient classical Greek philosophers. So some people might say, well, why are you doing a degree in philosophy, presuming it's that? Of course it's not. And you'll see throughout these, uh, th these videos that what we're talking about in relation to philosophy is the actual knowledge or the science of what it is, your domain of study, that you're actually considering. So that's what we're going to do in these videos, is to start exploring some of the issues around knowledge, um, identifying what we call knowledge and how we call it knowledge, and that's our epistemology, and then the different types of creations that emanate out of this, the ontologies. For those of you who know me from teaching before, you'll know that I really love um, the, the understanding of words, the etymology, the origins of words, seeing where they come from and how they're constructed within our language for today. So philosophy is no exception there. It comes from two ancient Greek words, one of them, philia, is one of the three Greek words for love. And obviously we've got it in quite a lot of English words. So haemophilia, for example, means a love of oxygen within blood. Um, a bibliophile is somebody who loves books. Um, a pedophile, literally that term means a lover of children. But look at the way in which it's transformed, it's changed to the exact opposite today, now meaning an abuser of children. Okay, um, Philadelphia, the city, the city of brotherly love. So Adelphos is brother and Philia is a love of. Okay, and Sophia obviously was the ancient Greek goddess of wisdom. So philosophy is a lover of wisdom or a love, or a, yes, a love of wisdom. And when it comes to doing your research studies, when somebody says that they're doing a doctorate, for example, a PhD, uh, a doctorate in philosophy, then it's the love of wisdom of their particular field of knowledge, not that they're studying ancient Greek philosophers. Likewise, then, the word epistemology, so episteme, is um, a form of knowledge or a science. It's a way of knowing something. So we could say, uh, quite often we talk about a medical model, so we could call it the medical episteme, or a nursing episteme, or a biological episteme. All different ways of knowing. All different ways of knowing what we know, knowledge. Whereas epistemology, anything ending in ology, is the study of something. The word logos, or the plural logoi in Greek, means words, words about something. So the ology bit with anything. So biology, bios, is life. So biology is a study of life. Here, epistemology is a study of knowledge. Now, one of the websites that I frequently um, uh, recommend to you all is etymonline.com. So it's etymology, and etymology is the study of the origins of words. So when we're studying here epistemology, you could check that out, you could check out philosophy, um, you check out metaphysics, what does metaphysics mean and how, do, how does that apply to philosophy in general, but also then checking out the word ontology. So ontos in Greek means being. Now, when you consider the different ways of being, so if we're talking about a medical model of care or a medical episteme, look how that often puts people in different hierarchies. So the people with the knowledge, the, me the, the medical doctors, are normally seem to be at the top. And even the term patient is quite a disempowering term in many ways. It's the person who's a passive recipient of care. So one is doing for another. If you're going to talk about the social model, that's completely different. And especially when people start using words like clients or service users, it's putting uh, the care providers and the care receivers more on an equal footing together. So the ways of being are very different, whether you talk about someone being a patient or a client or a service user. Okay, So ontology is the study of ways of being. When it comes to considering how to do your studies, uh, whether that's at master's level or doctorate, don't jump in both feet first thinking, oh, I want to go off and do a survey, or I want to do focus groups, or I want to do um, a randomised control trial. You're jumping in at the wrong end there. 
really what you need to do is to consider well, what's the field of knowledge that you want to explore more about? What is it you're interested in? And um, what's going to be the best ways for you to look at that? So that's where epistemology comes in. What's your philosophical starting point or your epistemological starting point? If you say that you're interested in the whole um, phenomenon of domestic violence or intimate partner violence, but then what aspect of that is it that you're interested in? Is it how, um, more often than not, it's women who are victims in domestic violence? But even when you use the word victim, that's an ontological position or a positionality. Okay, uh, well, uh, when you talk about people being victims. And then the opposite that seen of a victim then would be the perpetrator, the one inflicting the violence. So you might say, well, if I'm interested in why victims of domestic violence um, tend to stay with their abusers. Why don't they just pack their bags and get out? So you're trying to explore it from the victim's point of view. And if you say, well, the majority of the victims I'll be working with are females, then it would make good sense to actually explore this from a feminist epistemological point of view. But on the other hand, you may be saying, well, well, if the majority of perpetrators are males, I'd love to know what's going on in the male mind that makes a man lash out and hit, hit out at others. What is it that makes some men um, violent, whether sexually, physically, emotionally, uh, um, uh, financially? Why are some men uh, so negative towards others? especially from a violent point of view. So I'd like to understand it from the male point of view. In that case, you're going to have to study more about masculinity studies. Or then you may be asking, well, in the healthcare world, how is it that poorer people tend to be uh, disenfranchised from accessing preventative healthcare? That, uh, that many of them would leave it until too late, and then when they go to hospital, they may need radical treatment for this. Why is it that poverty seems to be a real indicator here on why the determinants of health? So you might say, well, in that case, I'm going to look at it from a Marxist perspective, all to do with exploring capital. But then the more you read up about Marx, you realise that um, quite often he, he, he's been accused of not talking about women in relation to his studies more. So then you might think, right, well, I've read some stuff on Marx. Now I need to read a feminist critique of Marx to see the gaps that came out through what he was writing about. So epistemology is going to be a great way for you to explore all of these different avenues. Then when you understand your epistemological starting point, so you know the lens that you're going to be using to actually look at your studies, you know your epistemological lens that you're going to use, then that may dictate to you which type of methodology you're going to use. And so often people talk about three key methodologies or genres, um, uh, quantitative research, qualitative research, and mixed methods, a combination uh, to one degree or another of those two, okay? So if you say, well, I want to try to understand the lived experience of someone who is a victim of domestic violence. Well, then counting numbers about those, so quantitative research, may not be the best way to try to understand the lived experience. So you might say, well, if it's the lived experience I want to look at, then obviously I need to do this from a qualitative point of view. Once you've decided then which your main methodology is going to be, whether it's one or the other or a combination of both, then you'll know which methods or which tools are used within that methodology to actually operationalise those studies. So if you say, well, look, I want to explore the lived experience of someone who's a victim of domestic violence, and therefore I think maybe one-to-one -one interviews are going to be the best way of helping me to explore that. So it's qualitative research. And the way you're going to operationalise that is through one-to-one -one interviews. But you may play around with ideas. You may say, well, how about focus groups? So if you're going to use focus groups, on the one hand, you might say, well, yes, some people may feel that they can open up if they've got some solidarity with other people. So therefore, one may encourage the other. On the other hand, you may say, well, but the topics they're going to be discussing could be so personal, it might have the opposite effect as to close them down. So these are things that you need to consider in relation to what methods 
are going to enable you to best operationalize your methodology and to give you greater insight into your underlying um, epistemology. Now, this is the end of the first of three little videos, so don't forget to share your ideas with us. Once you've watched these videos, once you've worked through the larger Spark page that this is all embedded into, feel free to talk to us about all of this. And especially online, go into your Moodle course site and go to the, uh, the discussion forum for the particular week where you find these materials. And feel free to chat about all of this with the rest of us. Thanks for listening. Bye-bye.